Hello and welcome back to Japan Memo, the IISS Japan Chair Program podcast. Here we're joined by experts, strategists and practitioners to unpack why Japan matters in today's regional and global geopolitical landscape. I'm Robert Ward, IISS Japan Chair and Director of Geoeconomics and Strategy. And I am Mariko Togashi, IISS Research Fellow for Japanese Security and Defense Policy. We will be your host、uh, for this episode. Today, we're very much excited to welcome Professor Tanaka Koichiro and Hassan Al Hassan to discuss Japan's relations with the Middle Eastern countries. Professor Tanaka Koichiro is a professor at the Graduate School of Media and Governance at Keio University. His areas of expertise are international relations in the Middle East region, with a strong focus on Iran and Afghanistan. His previous careers include the managing director of the Institute of Energy Economics Japan, one of the world's leading energy think tanks, and the chief economist of the Japanese Institute of Middle Eastern Economics, which is the only private sector think tank in Japan specializing in research into the MENA region. Professor Tanaka has a degree from the Tokyo University of Foreign Studies and Iranian Persian Studies. Dr. Hassan Al Hassan is an IISS research fellow for Middle East policy. He has over a decade of experience as a scholar and practitioner of foreign policy in the Gulf region. He specializes in the Arab Gulf states' grand strategies, economic statecraft, and relations with the Asian powers. Hassan is regularly consulted by government, private corporations, and the media on strategic affairs in the Gulf and Middle East region. He recently published a paper, Gulf Bailout Diplomacy Aid as Economic Statecraft in a Turbulent Region. I strongly recommend the listeners to read. Thank you very much for being here to unpack Japan's relations with the Middle East today. Let's start our discussion with a look at how Japan's been maintaining its relationship with the Middle East, a region that's been important for Japan both geopolitically and strategically, not least because of Japan's heavy dependence on the import of crude from the Middle East. When I looked at the data just now, I think over 90% of Japan's、uh, imported crude comes from the region. Tanaka sensei, what have been the key Japanese strategic interests in the region? To begin with, yes, it's oil or energy, including LNG. Liquefied natural gas is a very important factor, element for、uh, Japanese society and、uh, economy to work, especially when it comes to power generation. We are really concerned about the freedom of navigation through the Persian Gulf, the Strait of Hormuz, and the Indian Ocean, Straits of Malacca, and beyond, that eventually would carry oil and natural gas to Japan. For that reason, maintaining the security. In the region is a lot of a paramount interest that Japan held and also holds, and also in the future would continue to hold towards the region. And I believe that that is the most important aspect of our relationship with the Middle East. And having said that, we need to see that there are no major conflicts in the region, as well as any disturbing elements or incidents that may occur in and out of the Persian Gulf, as well as the Strait of Hormuz. That would hamper the freedom of navigation. So we're trying our best with our allies and friends to maintain that sort of a security, although it is far beyond where we sit here in East Asia. Has Japan's、uh, interests in the region have these been changing in any way? Do you think? Well, a lot of people talked about the orientation out from the Middle East towards a, sh- a shift to other regions when it comes to source of energy. The history tells that we have failed in that, and today we're back again. Like you said, that our dependence on Middle East oil, especially the Strait of Hormuz, is up to 90 percent plus, which is a significant number that exceeds the days when we started talking about diversifying our resources away from the Middle East. Even during the era of the first oil shock in 1973. Our dependence on Middle East oil was like 75 percent. So now 95 percent last year would simply show that our policy, at least in this regard, has failed. And what do you think Japan needs to do to address that failure? Presumably, some of the solution lies in、uh, developing a sort of renewables energy policy within Japan, sort of the, the medium-term energy plan that was published a couple of years ago. Uh, suggested greater reliance on nuclear and so on. Do, do you think Japan's a- able to reduce this dependence? In a bigger picture, I believe that they are trying to do so. 
you look into the details, some things are really contradicting each other. And the problem here is that the newly developed or announced hydrogen strategy for Japan talks about shifting away from oil and hydrocarbon resources to hydrogen itself, or even using ammonia as a medium. And that would make sense, of course, in reducing our carbon emission. But when you look into the programs and projects where we are going to procure hydrogen is unlikely to be homemade here in Japan, still will be imported from other producers or suppliers, and eventually it would shift again towards the Middle East. Instead of using burning oil and gas from the Middle East, we would shift that away from the hydrocarbons to hydrogen itself or ammonia that would originate from the Middle East. So that again is likely to end in sort of a disastrous situation if we are to really try to diversify our energy resources. We need to touch on the conflict in Gaza. This week, there was a G7 foreign ministers meeting in Tokyo, and the conflict was mentioned in a joint communique. Japan's had a, within the context of the G7, I think, a sort of unique standpoint with regard to its, its views of the region. Could you elaborate for our listeners on what Japan's standpoint is and, and why it's different from uh, the other members of the G7? How do you think Japan has been dealing with the situation? The difference that we found ourselves in uh, with other G7 members was that the Europeans and the Americans have issued two times their own joint communique following the incident that occurred since October 7th. In both cases, that would mean that Japan stayed away or was not actually dealing with things in the same manner with the rest of the G7 allies. The difference lies, as I understand, is that we are quite concerned that going too far in, say, pressing the Palestinians, not only Hamas, but Palestinians, and alienating them would just simply result in alienating the global south from the G7 countries. And holding the chair this year for the G7 countries, Japan tried to maintain sort of a balance between the West and the so-called global south. And I believe that that was the chief reason of why we had some sort of a difference over the wordings and others within the G7 community. But now I believe that that was more or less solved with the announcement of the statement uh, last evening here in Tokyo. For our listeners, could you elaborate a bit on the statement itself? Oh, yes. Well, the most important part was that it again talks, I mean, it does talk about the humanitarian pause which is the first time that the G7 countries have come up with as a joint statement. Although the Global South still may not be satisfied 100% with that, at least we have shown that we can talk in one voice. And that, I believe, is the basis of what we can do at this moment. Of course, we need to avoid further bloodshed. We need to avoid humanitarian disaster while explicitly condemning the terrorist attacks by Hamas on October 7th, no doubt about that. And that is all there. And also included was the right for Israel to exert the right for self-defense, although it should be maintained within the framework or exerted in the framework of the international law, which was not exactly there in previous uh, individual statements, like from the United States initially. Do you think that given this, as you've been saying, this this unique standpoint that Japan has, do you think it can play a sort of decisive role in resolving this particular conflict? A few years ago, former Prime Minister Abe Shinzo was went to Iran, tried to broker a deal as a go-between between Iran and the US. That didn't work. Do you think Japan's got a sort of special role to play here? It may not be a special role, but we have our own concerns, which is that if we further alienate the third world, it is likely that uh, the only countries that are going to benefit out from that, it will be countries like Russia and China, that they are luring these countries into their own camp, while we only talk about the values that are hardly kept by ourselves. If I may jump in, speaking of uh, Japan's concern, one of the biggest concerns from the Japanese perspective is, of course, that the conflict will spread in the region and cause an oil crisis 
And as you both touched on earlier, Japan's dependency ratio on crude oil imports from the region is extremely high. Hanako s e n s e i how has the Russian invasion of Ukraine affected this import dependency? And considering the rising geopolitical risk in the Middle East, what do you think the future development of Japan's energy security diplomacy looks like? That's a good point. One of the reasons that our dependency on Middle East oil exceeded 90% was because of the Russian aggression against Ukraine and invasion against Ukraine. And、uh, based on the sanctions policy that we adopted, along with our allies, we terminated our oil imports from Russia, which constituted about 5% of our imports. That led to the、uh, well, amount of oil to be substituted by other resources, which only could have been from the Middle East. And that is how it happened. For the long term policy, we are still concerned about the LNG imports that we continue from the Russian sources. And we do have the Japanese companies, as well as the government, h a s a stake in the Sakhalin 2 project. And also, private companies, entities have invested in the Arctic 2 project here again. Well, especially the Sakhalin 2, we are, say, picking up like 9% to 10% of our LNG from that project. If the G7 countries, if not the United Nations, but if the G7 countries are to start placing the LNG Russian exports under sanctions regime, then we are going to face enormous trouble. Now, 5% of oil could be substituted by other sources, even though we may have to pay a little bit higher. But、uh, LNG, 10% of LNG for Japan is an extremely difficult condition. We actually do not have that sort of a capacity, spare capacity that we can find in the market. Well, thank you so much, t a n a k a s e n s e i for your comprehensive input about Japan's policy in the Middle East. Now, I'd like to broaden our perspectives in the region to other countries' strategic interests. To understand the complexity of the region, it is particularly important to understand the geopolitical and economic motivations of great powers such as the US and China. Hassan, the Middle East is the region that has its internal uncertainties, but it is also the battleground of great power politics. Could you please give us a bigger picture of how great power competition is played, especially between the US, which has a strong influence in the region, and China, which has been increasingly flexing its economic and diplomatic clout recently? The Gulf region and the Middle East region in particular has been. Underpinned for the most part by a security architecture that is centered around and against the US. So the US has been the defining security player in the region. Its security footprint grew massively in the aftermath of the Iraqi invasion of Kuwait in 1990 and the Gulf War in 1991. That meant that there was now a significant quasi permanent stationing of US troops. In almost all of the Gulf states. However, in recent years, what has happened was that with the US announcing a pivot to Asia, with the US increasingly disengaging from the Middle East, wrapping up its forever wars in Iraq, in Afghanistan, lightening its footprint, scaling back on its security commitment to the region, not responding to Iranian attacks against Saudi oil facilities in 2019. All of that has created a widely shared perception in the region of US disengagement and of the US playing a decreasingly prominent role in the security and geopolitical landscape in the Middle East. And what that has sparked, in my view, is a desire to seek and pursue strategic diversification. One of the most natural partners from an economic perspective for the Gulf states and for the wider Middle East is to look towards China, because China is, for the most part, the most important trading and economic partner for all of these nations. China came in, obviously, with the Belt and Road Initiative, which included Iran, which included a number of other countries, but incidentally, Initially bypassed、uh, the Arabian Peninsula and therefore many of the Arab Gulf states. But through a process of gradual mutual adjustment, the BRI became a very important framework for China to engage and build a more strategic set of relations in the region. So, from the perspective of 
the Gulf states in particular, there are core security interests that are shared with the U.S. The U.S. remains the most important security partner. It continues to retain a large military presence. There are core economic interests with China. China is the biggest trading partner. It's the biggest market for oil exports for the oil exporting states in the region. And of course, core energy interests with Russia as well, since the oil exporting states in the region, whether Gulf states or even Algeria and others, are co-managing oil markets from the supplier perspective within OPEC Plus in cooperation, in tandem with the Russians. So from the perspective of the Middle Eastern countries, strategic diversification is not a luxury, it's a strategic necessity because of the fact that the security, economic and energy interests happen to lie with these various great powers. You mentioned mutual adjustment. And in your recent report, you analyzed the Middle East uh, use of bailout diplomacy extensively, but given the increasing China's presence in the region that you just mentioned, how has the Middle Eastern countries changed their behavior, if any, when you say mutual adjustment? In a sense, if if we look at China's priorities in the MENA region from a geoeconomic standpoint, China has paid a lot of attention to Iraq and the Iraqi oil sector. Iraq is a major recipient of BRI financing, loans, soft loans, swaps, and other forms of instruments. We've seen a widening of China's geoeconomic footprint as well, with China providing soft loans to Oman, uh, credit swaps to Egypt, also maintaining similar relations with Turkey. And then, of course, on the digital Silk Road, the UAE and Israel coming up as important digital Silk Road partners within China's BRI. That has meant that as a result, on top of this layer of economic cooperation, of course, longstanding trade relations, but also increasingly investment and funding under the BRI, that has meant that the Gulf states have, and many other recipients of Chinese loans and financing, have taken a very strong position on defending a non-aligned or a multi-aligned strategic orientation in the sense that they have, as a result, chosen not to take sides in the great power competition that is primarily playing out in the economic domain. And this applies to China. It also applies to Russia, meaning that almost none of the Middle Eastern countries chose to enforce any Western sanctions on Russia. And that was made, again, out of this perceived need to maintain a non-aligned or a multi-aligned posture and to essentially shield the region from the worst effects of great power competition. Given this changing great power competition in the region, Tanaka-sensei, what do you think Japan should do or do more in the region to further its interests given BRI competition from China? Well, we are facing a very difficult situation here. Our alliance with the United States is pivotal for our existence here in East Asia. While following 100% of what the United States or Washington dictates on us, especially is not welcomed amongst other countries, especially in the Middle East. A lot of countries have directly in face criticized me of Japan's policy vis-a-vis the Middle East as simply conveying messages from Washington in the mouth of the Japanese prime minister or foreign minister. One of the reasons that uh, during the current crisis over Gaza, that our position has shifted away from our traditional position vis-a-vis the Middle East is that we are now concerned of what we do or actually say governed by what Washington considers best for their interest. But uh, one thing that uh, totally differs between Tokyo and Washington is that the United States today is, in terms of energy, self-sufficient. And they actually do not need to import gas, natural gas, or crude oil from other countries. Although they do commercially, but in necessity, they don't. While the United States are totally fine with that, we are totally in a different position here. And we need to look into our own interests and our own survival. And also, we have competitors, strategic competitors here in East Asia, with like China. And we do not see it in our benefit to have the Middle East countries sway towards China in the way that we have been seeing for the past several years. I agree with almost everything that Professor Tanaka has said. The historical, I think, 
uh, reality of Japan's foreign policy in the Middle East is that it has tended to fly under the U.S. wing for the most part, in the sense that if you look at Japan's participation in the 1991 Gulf War that was done in tandem with the U.S. Japan is a member of the combined U.S.-led combined maritime forces, which are based in, in Bahrain, and which act as a maritime security force that essentially polices the seas for counter piracy, for counter narcotic smuggling, but also to preserve freedom of navigation. And even actually, if we look at Japan's aid policy in the Middle East region, that happened, I mean, especially during the 1990s to Jordan and Egypt in support of the Israeli-Palestinian peace process that also happened, let's say, in a way that was very complementary with U.S. interests. And so I think the challenge for Japan, of course, it makes sense for Japan to take such a policy because ultimately Japan's main strategic interest in the region is energy. The U.S. is the most important military player that guarantees the freedom of navigation in the Strait of Hormuz and has a robust military presence in the oil exporting Gulf states. And so from a sort of in a very big picture perspective, the, the policy made sense. The issue now, I think, is that Japan does not achieve brand differentiation in the MENA region. It's seen, as Professor Tanaka has said, as essentially a complement of US foreign policy. It's very much seen under the framework of the G7 as essentially a very close partner of the US. And I think what that means is that this, I do think, probably hampers Japan's ability to on its own merits and using its own resources to compete strategically with other great power competitors in the Middle East notably China and, of course, Russia as well. Japan does a lot in terms of investments and development cooperation. Uh, it doesn't get a lot of publicity for it, but it is a significant investment player in the MENA region. But I think it has not yet managed to leverage its geoeconomic presence. It's, of course, one of the top three oil markets for countries in the Gulf after India and China. So it's not to say that Japan is not an important economic partner. It is in multiple respects, in terms of energy, in terms of trade, in terms of investments, ODA. But I don't think that Japan has been very successful to date in leveraging this geoeconomic footprint, its geoeconomic presence in the region, to serve its own foreign policy or national security interests, in, especially in the context of the current great power competition, in a way that sets it apart somewhat from the US. Uh, Tanaka-sensei, I can see you you nodding. Right. Would you like to uh, make a comment? I perfectly agree with Hassan's evaluation of how Japan hasn't been, say, utilizing its geo-economic or geostrategic positioning in the Middle East. But I believe that it's not only about the Middle East that we fail to actually capitalize on our positioning. I think it happened everywhere. Even in uh, North America, during the days that the economic boom was here in the late 1980s to early 1990s, we were buying so many of the assets here and there, taking over MAs, that and that. But then eventually nothing happened. I mean, we actually weren't working on a strategic mind. We were just gaining on our, what, we, what we earned for the day. And in the end, we ended up with virtually nothing. Uh, maybe some uh, may well remember the days when we were there physically and also by name. Today, a lot of people have already forgotten how we were back in those days. And we don't seem to have that sort of a strategic maneuvering Maybe uh, it's sort of a history that we have inherited from our ancestors way back from the Tokugawa shogunate. So, Hassan, having heard that, what would you say to our listeners in the policy community in Japan about what Japan could do more to contribute to prosperity and stability in, in the Middle East? One thing that Japan could most certainly do is engage more consistently at a higher level. So we've seen the Japanese prime minister pay visits to the UAE, to Saudi Arabia, to Qatar. That was an important milestone. But the fact of the matter is that in the Gulf, if you want to get anything done, you need to have a robust interpersonal relationship, consistent engagement with top level leadership. That's what, of course, obviously the Americans do. That's what the other Asian powers do, like the Chinese, the Indians. There is a consistent high-level 
diplomatic engagement that allows these countries to push things forward to exert greater influence. So I think that's an important uh, step to take. The other important step to take is for Japan, I think, to articulate very clearly beyond energy security what its interests and objectives are in the Middle East region. What is the Japanese value proposition here? And with the Americans, you get the security commitment. With the Chinese, you get the Belt and Road Initiative. What does Japan have to offer? And of course, that's not to say that there isn't anything in reality. As I said, Japan is an important aid player. It's an important development player. It's an important investor. But again, it hasn't articulated the strategic direction, the strategic objectives, underpinnings of those instruments that are at its disposal. I suspect Japan will, however, face challenges in trying to create a distinct brand identity, so to speak, in the Middle East region, because it will, I think, constantly be torn or at least pulled in different directions, including by its membership of the G7. So just to go back to the current Gaza crisis issue, uh, the Japanese position is very difficult to distinguish on this issue from the broader Western position. So Japan abstained at uh, the UN General Assembly vote last week on the Jordanian resolution that was approved by a majority of 121 countries uh, on the Israel-Gaza, Israel-Hamas war going on in Gaza at the moment. The statement of the foreign ministers at the G7 reads very much like broadly a an expression of what broadly Western position would be, even if there might have been subtle tugs and and pushes on the part of the Japanese. But it's very difficult to see that in the final product, in the final message that came out. It read very much like a position that was more overtly sympathetic with the Israeli view on the current crisis. So I think the Japanese, if they are interested in playing a more significant, influential role in the Middle East, would have to, I think, do more to create a distinct Japanese brand to articulate the value proposition and to be able to articulate a more independent foreign policy posture on regional issues, regional conflicts, vis-a-vis its traditional Western partners. We've had a question following on from that to Tanaka-sensei. Given the geopolitical competition in the region and the complexities and what Hassan was was talking about, the, the value proposition, how do you think that Japan should develop its partnerships for engagement in the region, particularly with the US? Does there need to be any sort of change of course there, do you think? We cannot totally, say, move away from the United States position as an ally, and we cannot openly criticize how they think or how they have conducting their policy vis-a-vis the Middle East or even the rest of the world. One thing that is clear for us, as I, my personal view here, is that the Japanese government refrains from openly criticizing countries, foreign countries. Of course, uh, uh, under certain conditions we do. Yes, we condemned Hamas's terrorist attacks. Yes, that's clear cut. We criticize the Chinese mishandling of their own citizens like the uh, Uyghurs of Xinjiang. That is also quite clear. The other issues, Japan remains extremely quiet. That's one reason our foreign policy is not so clear cut or maybe so distinctive in a way that everybody could understand. Not even in the Middle East. I believe that a lot of countries are really puzzled of how we think and how we act. And the Middle East is not an exception to that. Even in the Middle East, if we look back to what happened in Gaza in 2014, or even um, in between from uh, 2014 to 2023, there have been multiple incidents. There was a rocket attack out from Gaza and then the Israelis army and the Israeli IDF forces responded. The result was that, I mean, there have been heavy casualties on the side of the Palestinians residing inside Gaza. And even during the days when the Japanese government had provided aid for the Palestinian National Authority to construct the only airstrip inside Gaza. And then in 2001, the Israeli forces had totally destroyed that, and it remains in rubbles as of today. I mean, it was made out of Japanese taxpayers' money, but we didn't even condemn that. So, I mean, we are totally silent in most cases when we start criticizing others. The case of the Israeli excessive use of a military force against civilians by the Israelis in Gaza or in other locations, we remain quiet. We haven't openly criticized that either.
So that's sort of about the way you are maintaining a balance in Japanese foreign policy. Although it is difficult to understand, as a Japanese, I have somehow come to understand that that is the way that Japanese foreign policy is and will be in the future as well. And Hassan, you've talked about the region's strategic diversification, and perhaps one could add its rising strategic confidence as well. What do you think the major challenges are that Japan might face in the future in trying to engage with the region? A lot of it really stems from what Professor Tanaka-san has said, in the sense that the level of geopolitical complexity in the region is actually very difficult to contend with. Just take the example of, and this goes back to the question of what the strategic diversification entails in terms of mutual adjustments between the Gulf states, for example, say, and China. And so, for example, the Arab and Muslim states, for the most part, and Turkey is an exception here, and some of the Southeast Asian nations initially were a bit of an exception, but most of the Arab states don't criticize China on the treatment of Uyghur Muslims in Xinjiang. They don't criticize India on the treatment of Indian Muslims in Kashmir, for example. So these are choices that have been made, changes in foreign policy, because Kashmir, for example, used to be a massive issue that used to unite all Muslim-majority countries within the auspices of the Organization of Islamic Cooperation. But this is no longer the case. It's no longer a consensus issue because of India's a strategic heft, a geoeconomic heft in the region, and the desire to build strategic relations with India. What ends up happening is you end up with this very dizzying, geopolitically complex situation where the Arab Gulf states and other countries in the MENA region might be criticizing Israel, of course, for its heavy-handedness and violations of international law in Palestine, but at the same time, have relations with Israel for a minority of them, and at the same time not criticize the Chinese or the Indians for the way they treat their own domestic populations and so on. It is a very complex geopolitical landscape to navigate. There are no clear-cut lines. There are no clear-cut alliances that arrange everything. It's really a multi-aligned landscape where you see different coalitions of countries agreeing on certain issues, but not on others, and other coalitions coming up to deal with certain issues and not others and so on. So I think the geopolitical complexity makes it very difficult to navigate various patterns of partnerships within the region. That, I think, is a challenge that not only faces Japan, but really faces any country trying to deal with the MENA region. Thank you very much for such a rich discussion to unpack such a complicated issue. As much as we would love to continue this conversation, unfortunately, this is coming closer to an end. In every episode of our Japan Memo, we ask all of our guests two questions. The first question is, do you have a book recommendation for listeners who wish to understand Japan? Tanaka-sensei? If it's okay uh, not to recommend a book, but a sort of an author or a scholar, this is a Dr. Falhad Tagizadeh. He's an Iranian origin uh, who had studied here in Japan during his master's and doctoral degrees, and he's currently teaching in Japanese university. And he has written in English multiple books and papers on the, how the Japanese economy has been developing in the post-war period. So, I mean, the post-war Japanese economy was sort of a topic that a lot of authors and researchers have followed in the 1980s and 90s. Here again, uh, we see a new generation, he's very young, of uh, foreign scholars who have studied with the Japanese government scholarship here in Japan and obtained the doctoral degree and is teaching here in Japan and has written about Japan. I believe that that would uh, give sort of an idea of how Japan is uh, in the eyes of a Middle Westerner. Hassan? Sure. It's not a book, but more of an author. His name is Professor Muhammad Jabir al-Ansari. And Professor Muhammad Jabir al-Ansari was, and still is, I think he still is alive, a Bahraini thinker who uh, achieved notoriety uh, across the Arab world, especially 1970s, 1980s. Uh, He was mostly an Arab nationalist thinker, but he was totally fascinated by the Japanese experience and by the fact that Japan was able to rise into a global industrial powerhouse, 
And in doing so, in, especially in its being a non-Western nation that was able to achieve global power status. So to him, this was a very important, and to many other actually Arab nationalist thinkers as well, this was an important illustration of how non-Western uh, civilizations, non-Western states could in fact, uh, replicate these, this experience of industrialization and uh, achieve great power uh, status. So there was quite a bit of fascination with Japan on, on that basis. And he wrote many articles and, and uh, the Japanese experience is present in many of his books as a role model, but also as an Asian power that the Arab countries needed to pay attention to and to begin to diversify their foreign relations by seeking closer relations with. Thank you. That's definitely being added to uh, my already long list of holiday readings. So the second question is, what do you think people often get wrong about Japan? Hassan, what do you think? I'm not sure that it's a misconception, but it might actually be very accurate. I don't know. You, you most certainly know Japan better than I do. But I think at least in the Middle East and the Arab world, I think there is a stereotype about Japanese people is being very courteous, very respectful, but also very disciplined and very punctual. So you'll tell me if this is an accurate perception, but in general, I think it's a very benign view of Japanese people that people in the Middle East have. That tends to be the common stereotype. Okay, I guess I have to live up to that. But um, what about Tanaka-sensei? <laughs> I think in the Middle East, a lot of people today have lost the concept or at least know about Japan anymore. I mean, in the 1980s, up until the 90s, I believe, a lot of uh, Japanese well products and brands were there in the well lifestyle of the Middle Eastern people. Electric home appliances, a lot of them, or most of them, had Japanese brands, although the product itself was not produced inside Japan anymore. It was made in countries like Malaysia or somewhere in uh, Southeast Asia. But still, the brand was Japanese, and a lot of people knew about Japan through those brand names. Now, today, they hardly see anything that is Japanese. Maybe Toyota cars, Honda cars, Nissans, that may be the only thing that they see around themselves. They consider that Japan is today about animation and something that may be kawaii or cool, I don't know, but uh, that, that is not Japan. That is only part of Japan. <laughs> Hassan, you wanted to come in on that. Well, I mean, Professor Tanaka conjured, you know, my childhood memories because in, in a sense, my generation grew up, I'm in my early 30s, grew up watching Japanese cartoons dubbed in Arabic. Many, 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 many of them. I can I can recount them, and I still sometimes, you know, out of nostalgia, replay some of the, you know, the, the songs and uh, and so on. So we did grow up actually watching Japanese cartoons. And the interesting thing was that uh, many of the Arab governments that were sponsoring these sort of translations, the dubbing effort, actually saw Japanese cartoons as being very compatible with Arab values. The insistence on honor, on family, and things like that were were found were thought to be very culturally compatible. Many things get lost in translation and, and people added their own flavor to it. But I must say that Japanese cartoons were an intrinsic part of the childhood of most people that are in their 30s in the Arab world. Well, a discussion on anime, what a wonderful way to, to end uh, a very rich uh, discussion about geopolitics as well. So thank you so much, Tanaka-sensei and, and Hassan, for your time for joining us today. And thanks also to our listeners for joining us on another episode of Japan Memo. If you enjoyed this episode, we urge you to subscribe to Japan Memo on the podcast platform of your choice. And for more insightful analysis, I also encourage you to look at past research by the Japan Chair Programme and by the broader IISS on our website. We also hope to connect with you on Twitter, where we're actively sharing the latest news and analysis on everything Japanese, geopolitics and more. You can find me at Robert Allen Ward, Mariko at Togashi Mariko and Hassan at HT. Al Hassan. Thank you very much for listening and see you next time.